Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Welcome to Technology and Trends Powering Home-Based Care and Its Workforce, hosted by Home Health Care News and sponsored by Access. Hi, I'm Deborah Hoyt, Senior Vice President of Public Policy at Access, and it's my pleasure to welcome today's expert panelists and my colleagues, Arlene Maxim, Chief Clinical Consultant, and Tammy Ross, Senior Vice President of Professional Services. Welcome, ladies. Hi, Deb. So, <laughs> how are you? Before we begin our conversation, um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. This is a live webinar. Our goal is to make it interactive and engaging by answering your questions in real time. So please submit them through the question text box and Tammy and Arlene will respond to as many as possible during our hour together. We will also be leveraging technology by conducting two live polling questions as part of today's conversations. By clicking on the multiple choice answers when prompted, you will provide real-time input for our panel so they can ensure the conversation addresses your most pressing needs. And lastly, this session is being recorded and every registrant will receive a follow-up email from Home Healthcare News with a link to the recorded sessions so you can sit down and share the information with your staff. Both Tammy Ross and Arlene Maxim are leaders at Access and nurses by background and have decades of experience in home health operations, compliance, quality, staffing, and consulting. Their insights today will inspire you to adopt new innovations like online training and on-demand staffing solutions to create a ready workforce to meet increasing demand and more complex patient needs. In every industry, technology advancements have always been a disruptor. The latest disruptor in healthcare, particularly in home-based care, is the consumer. Today's consumers are educated. They understand that they can receive healthcare in the home for most situations. So it's natural that consumers are demanding an anytime, anywhere, 24 seven home-based care model, much like how the transportation industry was transformed by Uber and the home meal delivery by DoorDash. Our provider sector needs mobile technology right now that will accommodate consumer demand and the increases in referrals to the home. The most challenging piece of the equation is pairing the consumer demand with a competent and skilled workforce that is ready, willing, and able to deliver the right quality care 24 seven in people's homes. Tammy and Arlene are the ex experts at this and they're gonna help us understand how a fresh approach to staffing and technology can ready us for today's additional volume of patients and leverage technology to reduce documentation burden and increase time devoted to hands-on patient care. So hi, Tammy, hi, Arlene. We're gonna start with Tammy first. Tammy, we now understand that using old thinking, including staff incentives, skills training, and incremental wage increases just aren't enough anymore, or they're not sustainable to address the tremendous consumer demand and the post-COVID preference for in-home care. So what's your thinking around how the industry needs to look at evolving the clinical pipeline and address this workforce issue in a way that we can meet the needs of aging adults in their home? Thanks, Deb, for that question. And I'm so glad you didn't say how many decades of nursing Arlene and I have. Um, so thank you for that too. Uh, but when we, we talk about the age old problem of workforce management and we, we look at things that's been done as long as I've been in home health, which is over 30 years. And, and a lot of that is around wages, it's around sign-on bonuses, and we keep doing that same thing over and over. Um, our psychiatric nurses that may be tuned in, um, that's kind of the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It's, it's just not happening. Uh, we're all fishing out of the same pond and those, those salary and wages have caps to them. So we need to look at other ways to attract the workforce. We know the average retirement age for a nurse is about 58 years old, um, relatively young and it gets younger every day as I proceed in that direction. Um, there's still a lot of, 
of clinical value and a lot of knowledge in these nurses that are retiring at early retirement. It's what I would call early retirement 58. But maybe they don't want to work full time. Maybe, you know, they they lack, like you said, the skills and the competence um, because healthcare changes very quickly. Um, it, it's very fast paced. So what we've done at Access is, is we have addressed that competency and that confidence issue, um, especially um, in our retired nurses. They want to know it all before they attack and try to do something, right? And so we've developed an online training program that's a um, certification program. It gives continuing education hours and it's modular. You can do it um, usually 20 minutes at a time, sometimes even five to 10 minute modules. And while you're learning, you're getting continuing education. That's really important to that retired nurse force to keep up their CEs and their competency. Um, and then my friend Arlene has some other part of that is that flexibility with staffing. And I'm sure she'll address it later with that Uberization of healthcare. Thank you, Tammy. I appreciate that. Um, Arlene's going to talk a little bit about the Uberization, but I think before we go on to that, can you explain to me the certification piece? Certification for what levels of home-based care and exactly you know, what does that address and then what does the individual come out with at the end of the certifi online certification training? Thanks, Deb. Yes, absolutely. So certification for staff in three different ways either clinical, financial, or operational. Most of our nurses are gonna be interested in clinical. And also we offer that through different tracks, home health, um, certified and non-certified, um, which means our private attendant services. Um, some people call it non-skilled, I call it very skilled. Caregivers are very skilled services. And then we also offer hospice. Um, we're new and upcoming as palliative care. That's gonna be a big push, um, especially in 2022. So they'll come away with a certification in, in one of those products or all of those products, depending on what they wanna do. Um, in addition to that, they'll come away with CEUs. Um, our program offers up to 66 continuing education hours. So that alone is more than enough for renewing your nursing licensure. Um, so we think that's very important. And then we offer it a kind of a combination of um, industry knowledge and also uh, solution knowledge. We, we have to train in the industry and we have to train in technology and we kind of marry those together. Um, by putting those together, we're teaching that nurse how to use technology to be more efficient in her job um, so that she can get more time with the patient, more bedside time, and less screen time on a computer. Uh, when I think about the average age of a home health nurse, about 55 years old, you think about that and you think about technology being a barrier. We never want that. We want technology to be very easy for that nurse. Um, and we want it to be almost like a nurse on your shoulder. That's what I like to say. Um, it guides them with their documentation. Um, Arlene has years in uh, compliance um, and has done many mock surveys. And one of the things we get in trouble about is not documenting correctly. Um, we're not documenting um, according to the regs. Well, this nurse on your shoulder, um, artificial intelligence, guides that nurse on how to document so she can focus on the care on the bedside and not necessarily on, you know, what exactly do I have to document? Thanks, Tammy. So let's move on to Arlene's piece. So we're talking about transforming the delivery of home-based care by utilizing nurses and other um, you know, non-skilled workers or anybody within the workforce and bringing them back to home-based care through certifying them through home health, home care, and hospice on the clinical and operational side, but also so they can understand the regulations. So that's, that's really, a new approach to trying to bring in more individuals into this workforce, which is what we desperately need. So that's that's very significant, Tammy, and I'm really um, interested in hearing how Access is doing that and taking it to the next level, which Arlene's going to talk about. Um, you know, because we know that the home-based care workforce is being transformed, whether we like it or not, right? So 
you know, technology has been transforming industries, you know, across all sectors, but now it's the time for home-based care. And savvy consumers are already requesting this. They have the handheld technology. We're talking about a cell phone being able to do everything for people um, that involves their home-based care or healthcare across all sectors and communicating with doctors and physicians and hospitals. So Arlene, talk to us a little bit about how you're going to be taking technology and applying it to home-based care and kind of intersecting that with what Tammy talked about, the certification and building up of the workforce. Well, the, um, thanks, Deb, um, and thanks, Tammy, for giving us an overview of that certification. This is probably one of the most amazing thing that's ever happened in the time frame I've been in home health care. Uh, the certification that um, Access has put together is just absolutely amazing, and it's always been my concern that clinicians don't understand the regulations and they don't understand why they're doing things. And I think it's really important that if we're gonna do something, we need to know why. Uh, we're all intelligent people and I think no matter where you are in working in the healthcare field, you're um, more likely to be able to be successful if you know why you're doing something. So uh, with the certification program clearly has opened that door and allowed us, allowed every clinician to understand why they're doing certain things, why they're documenting things that they don't understand why they have to document. Uh, Medicare policy and conditions of participation many times intersect and not in a good way. And they sometimes they are saying different things in a different way. And so clinicians don't understand that. And so the certification program has brought that all together and it has allowed us then to understand as far as access is concerned, I they, they, as far as I'm concerned, they have a remarkable product that allows us to um, document, be able to schedule things in a timely fashion. Um, the, the billing that's available to them, um, access to payment, um, access, uh, uh, access has a um, the DDE program that actually allows agencies to get paid about two days faster than most people do because they have to go through the Medicare program. Access goes directly into Medicare. So it's absolutely phenomenal. So the technology that we have at, at the um, access on the access platform is pretty amazing as far as allowing people to do things um, in, ex in an expedited way, in an efficient way, in an effective way. So that, I mean, we have to be really careful, I think, that we understand all of this, and this is exactly why the certification program is coming out when it is, is we have value-based purchasing coming up very soon, <laughs> very soon. And um, many agencies don't even, aren't even aware that that's happening in January. And I think it's important that people understand what they're gonna have to know in order to be successful with value-based purchasing. There are gonna be winners, there are gonna be losers, and the losers aren't gonna be happy. And so um, at Access, we're um, working really hard to make sure that everyone's a winner. So I think, um, I think that's really, really important that that technology has allowed us to go that far, that we're gonna actually be able to, um, through artificial intelligence, make sure that these uh, patient outcomes are achieved at the end of their care. Um, is, it's critical. Can you can you talk a little bit about access care and how yeah. so home traditionally home health agencies, hospice agencies, and home care agencies were scheduling and billing and documenting things back in the office. The nurse or the clinician is out in the field, they come back to the office or they go home and they have to spend hours to you know input all of the information they need to input um, for you know to be compliant, but you're saying that now access care enables people to do that on a handheld mobile device and how does that work and is that secure fully compliant how does it enable the caregiver to spend more time with the client, the client rather than kind of back at her desk or his desk yeah access care is probably my favorite part of the whole access program and so access care is actually a mobile device it's an app that nurses can download if they're working for an access agency the nurses can download the app they can do all their documentation on the application agencies on the other hand can actually order nurses on their on the access system uh, they aren't necessarily nurses or they're not going to be nurses that actually work for them but they actually they work for access agencies in, in another location and if the nurse is on the app um 
she is uh, they, or she or he is able to um, access the schedule that the agency has um, displayed on the application and they can do visits on weekends and the evenings um, like uh, Tammy was talking about these retired nurses this is an excellent way to pick up extra money on weekends or on uh, during holidays um, again this is only available for access users right now but it's an absolutely incredible way to get extra staff right now with a workforce shortage that we're experiencing right now um, this is an exceptional way to be able to call for a nurse when you need it. It's almost like a just-in-time type of scheduling process, and you were able to access nurses who have specialty skills. One of the things I really like about this is that many times if you are in a smaller agency, you may not necessarily have an interstomal therapist available. If you have an interstomal therapist who has that app available, you can order that person and to go out and see your patient, see the patient that needs that type of service. Um, maybe IV therapy is something that you don't specialize in your agency, but if you're able to schedule um, a staff member who has that app available, who has those skills available, um, then they can access that person and expand not only their revenue source, but they can expand the, the, the referral source. I've talked to a number of agencies recently who are turning down massive numbers of referrals. I just had a call just before we got on this webinar to, uh, from a friend of mine in Michigan, and I'm in, in Florida, um, asking me if I could find her a nurse in Brighton, Michigan, because they were sending the patient, the doctor's office was trying to find a home care agency. They were sending the patient to the hospital. They could not find a nurse in a home care agency to take care of this person. It's getting really, really very bad out there. and. Um, the Access app um, is a solution for this. And um, the more people that find out about this, the more it's going to be used. Um, on the With Access Care, we actually have user groups that everyone's allowed to get on, and we do education as far as the app is concerned, but also about the industry, uh, related to the industry. So um, it's a great program. It's um, incredible. It's, it's free to access users. No one pays for it. The only thing you pay for is a visit. And so um, it's an incredible use of technology that John Lajade, our um, founder and owner, um, came up with about four years ago. And it's just expanded to the place. We've done over 60,000 visits now. And as far as HIPAA compliance, everything is absolutely HIPAA compliant. Everything is, uh, we have every, every single thing in compliance. There's a, a personnel record available for each one of the nurses. So. When agencies have surveys, all they have to do is bring up that information that satisfies the surveyor. As far as documentation is concerned, what I've heard from agencies who are using Access Care is the documentation is not only incredibly um, well done, but it comes to them faster. And that's because we're paying the nurse, we, the Access Care app and that availability through um, the agency is uh, funding the nurse uh, it, right after the quality assurance is done on the documentation that's submitted. So they get paid much more frequently. They get paid even faster than one week, so typically. So um, I, I wanna make it clear that this is not a staffing agency. This is an application. And so um, it's very much like you said, like Uber. Um, and uh, so we have a map, um, I we don't, Oh, but that the map is very cool because you can actually see where the nurses are located. So if you need a nurse in a certain location, you can um, ask that nurse specifically to see a patient close to them. Um, what I think is very nice about this too, not nice, it's incredibly effective, is that if you have an emergency going on with a patient, for instance, if their catheter falls out or if they their dressing falls off or something like that, you can look at that map, see what nurse is close to that patient and perhaps contact that nurse to see that patient that's close by them. So I there's so many advantages to using the Access Care app. Um, I just think it's probably one of the most effective technologies that have come out, at least for our industry. Thank you, Arlene. That was really interesting. So I'm trying to envision now. So Tammy, if you're saying that you can certify 
individuals, whether they're retired nurses, maybe they're nurses that have come out of, you know, skilled nursing facilities or hospitals that say, I no, want, I no longer want to work in that setting, but I'd like to work on my own schedule and pick up, you know, three home care visits in the morning and, you know, one or two in the afternoon. Can the certification enable them to get skilled up to the level where they can use this handheld technology that Arlene's talking about? Deb, I love that question and you're right on track because that's exactly what we're solving for. You know, there's a real um, distribution issue among clinical skills. So prior to say five years ago, you know, the future of healthcare was in the hospital. Maybe 10 years ago, everybody went to the hospital. You know, everything was treated in the hospital. But the pandemic really opened our eyes. And it, what it did is it opened our eyes to the future of healthcare. It's been in the home and it's been there for a while, but the pandemic shined like a big spotlight on it. As we started seeing all these patients that could not be cared for in the hospital due to pandemic crisis, they were being cared for in the home. So all these nurses that have been trained in acute care, hospital-based care, or maybe even SNF care, were finding that you know, they wanted to transition into to home health care or perhaps even hospice care. Now, being able to make that transition, it, it, it's a, it's a skill set, right? We all speak a different language. There was once upon a time I was a certified critical care nurse. That's an entire different language than a home health nurse. Um, and learning how to speak that language and learning the regs is, is a competency skill that e those nurses need to obtain. So absolutely, certification is meant to be able to redistribute those nurses that may want to transition from acute care um, into the home, or maybe those nurses that want to do both. Maybe they want to treat the patient in the hospital, and maybe you know they want to see one or two visits after the hospital care in the home. So they have kind of the best of both worlds. Um, certification allows them to do that by giving them that mobile opportunity. You can train on it anytime, anywhere. Uh, for home health, it's about six hours of training. Uh, we include um, all the required in-service training. We include all of the um, standard regulatory training, plus we train you on how to use the system efficiently and effectively. I think that's the real key. Um, we make technology their friend, not their foe. Um, they want to use access care because it's so easy. Um, I remember a time um, I would have rather took a pen and paper and wrote everything out than to pick up a computer or to, or to use an email, right? I'd rather go snail mail. Uh, and I think some of our nurses feel that way in the industry. They feel like... Um, I, I, this is a hindrance to me. It's 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 lengthening in my visit. It's keeping me from doing what I want to do. Um, certification bridges that, and it teaches on a level that any nurse can understand, from a brand new graduate all the way through um, a retired nurse. Um, it gives you that kind of level of competency. It also gives. Um, the people on the other side, the people that are validating these nurses, the, the operators, so to speak, the managers, the executive board, it gives them confidence because they have to um, pass off on every single skill and every single test. Um, there's a um, training program and then there's a competency evaluation with everything they do. And it's high level. Nurses are used to high critical level skills testing. And that's what we test on in the in the clinical component of certification. So Deb, you're right. You just kind of put it all together for us. And, and the good thing is what this does, coupled with access care, now you have a certified and you have a competent nurse that you can post visits for. So you have just saved yourself so much time. Arlene, I remember the days in Michigan when we were both in Michigan at one time together. Home health is a really small world. Um, we were both in Michigan, to get Michigan together, um, and I lived in San Antonio but worked there. And I would spend a day every Friday trying to staff patients for the weekend. It took me forever to be able to get enough staff to cover my weekend visits. 
And guess what I was doing? I was on the phone. Can you take another visit? Can I get you to work this weekend? With Access Care, you can post that out and you can get nurses externally and internally. Because sometimes there's nurses that may work a desk job. Their manager, their supervisor during the week, they want to keep up their clinical skills. Um, not to mention the extra money, but just keeping their foot in the door, right? A lot of nurses want to do that. Um, so being able to post those visits internally too will save you hours of time. Um, I, I, can, I can testify to it. I, I wish I'd have had it when I was um, leading organizations. It would have saved me um, a lot of time. I would have got to San Antonio before midnight on Friday night. I could have left more like at 10 or 11 o'clock to fly back. So um, thank you for making that connection, Deb. That was a great connection. Thanks, Tammy. I just want to ask Arlene now. So you said that we really don't have a workforce shortage. We have a distribution problem, right? It's a distribution of clinicians, clinical, non-clinical caregivers at all levels across all 50 states in all geographies, right? So Arlene, what about access care? So the mobile technology, is that just in a few states, where are you now? You said you mentioned 60,000 visits. You know, tell us a little bit about how you feel that this is gonna help address the workforce challenges that agencies have right now. Thank you for asking that. I, I failed to, to, to give that information. It's in all 50 states. Um, it's, it is available in all 50 states. Um, uh, we don't, we, do have something in um, Hawaii, and I think also Alaska. We recently had had some visits posted, but um, it is available. Um, what I really like about the app, as far as therapy is concerned, um, agencies can save a lot of money by using the application as opposed to using contract staff, and they have a little more control over it because they have control of the quality assurance and that type of thing. The other thing that this application does, as Tammy alluded to this about um, nurses spending, you know, being up until midnight, one o'clock in the morning. I remember doing that myself because I've done home visits in the past, um, doing documentation, and um, the application is so easy to use that most of the most of the information gets entered um, at the home or shortly after leaving the home, so that the, their memory is fresh. They the information is more accurate. Um, and so it's a, a excellent tool um, to use to get that documentation done so you don't have to give up family time. And that's one of the things that's happening is nurses are burning out um, and they're because there is just particularly in home care and in hospice too, um, we, we get so involved in our patient care um, that we fail to realize now we have to document that. And so, so if we're doing it as we're doing the care, um, it certainly saves an awful lot of time. And getting that information into the agency, it, it helps the agency uh, be compliant and ready for survey or audits at any time. That's great, Arlene. There's actually a question in the, in the question box that says, how about maintaining the personnel file of the nurse? I know Tammy said earlier that these, you know, clinicians are, will have to be certified before they can use this app. But yes. Talk about you know background checks and how these nurses are affiliated or not affiliated with different agencies or yeah. Every, everything everything about the nurse that anyone would ever need to know um, their background checks we hit we actually contract with a company to do the background checks so they're they're very well done um, and all the information is in there but everything about in a personnel file that you would need in a home care agency is housed in that application. So if a surveyor comes or if you have someone who's looking for that personnel, OSHA or what, whatever, looking for that personnel file, you have it accessible to you through the application. Perfect. Thank you for that question. We appreciate it. And Arlene, thank you for the answer on that. Tammy, sure. too. So we want this to be interactive. We said we're going to have two audience polls. What it is is going to be, uh, we're going to pull it up in just a second now. It's going to be a multiple choice question. And we're going to give the audience about, you know, 45 seconds to a minute to respond. You're literally just going to click on it with your cursor, your answer. You can actually 
select more than one here and the poll is open now the question is what training topics would most benefit your clinicians and organization and we have multiple answers here safety communication and or care coordination documentation and quality assurance medical specialty programs software and or technology or other or no additional training is needed at this time so if you want to click on this and participate and weigh in, it'll provide an opportunity for Tammy and Arlene to reflect on some of the trends we might see here. So we'll give you a moment to participate. So, boy, it's kind of spread out across the board, but documentation and quality assurance certainly look like they're um, high on the needs list. I'm going to turn this back to Tammy, just maybe reflect on this a little bit in terms of what the responses say to you. Yeah, Jeff, thank you so much. And um, I was polling for documentation and quality. I, I thought that would probably be number one, and it is at 76%. As we're starting to really move into that value-based purchasing world, people are understanding the importance of outcome-based quality care. Um, and that really is just going back to a quality assurance program. That's going back to what I said, going back to the basics. Um, and really delivering that patient care with an outcome in mind. It's goal-oriented and goal-driven. And seeing documentation on there, again, um, especially as we think about OASIS, value-based purchasing, and, and we think about regulatory standards. Um, how do we document compliantly? And how do we make that documentation less of a burden on our clinical staff? Um, I will say this is an area that we're addressing um, at Access within our certification program. It's not just certification. Those that have um, uh, a certification account also have access to all of our thought leadership and our partnership training. Um, and we have partnership training as well as Access thought leaders teaching on quality assurance. Um, so that's one way access is really, you know, partnering with the workforce to address quality assurance and documentation. Um, I think safety goes hand in hand with that. And I, I love the fact that software and technology is on there. You know, there are things that we can do that we don't even know that we can do. Optimizing your software, optimizing your technology is a key to efficiencies going forward and really is the key to workforce management um, now and, and forevermore. Thank you, Tammy. Valerie, I guess you can pull down this the responses to this poll. We appreciate that. And actually, there's a couple of questions that, we, that kind of tie into this. So let's see if we can answer some of them now. Um, let's see. Um, one individual was asking, how do I get more information about the certification? Tammy, you just talked about the certification, but is it available now? What's the schedule on the rollout? Sure. Thanks, Deb. You know, we pilot tested this and then we beta tested it and then we retested it again. Um, and we've tested it on about 650 um, assessments. That's what we call ourselves, people who work for access. So everybody at Access has had to take the highest level of certification. You know, for me, it was great as the program leader because I got a lot of great feedback from people that you know, just span the scope. We had clinicians, we had non-industry people, we had financial managers. So that was really good input. But for Access, what that did is put our skills level up here. We just really raised the bar. Can you imagine investing 650 people into this robust of a training program? It was funny, I, I kind of laughed and told the CFO I was gonna send him a set of scrubs. Um, he knew clinical stuff as well as I did when he finished. Um, so it is not available to the public now, but it will be January, 2022. At this point, it is only available if you're a current Access client. We'll, we will be rolling it out to our Access clients in um, early January. Now for Access Care, um, Arlene and I have this little fun thing that we're doing uh, for some of our clinicians of the month and some of our super performance performers in Access Care will get early access to certification. But you'll be seeing a lot of information coming out from Access around it. But in the meantime, you can go to access.com 
um, backslash certification and put your name on the waiting list. Thanks, Tam. And I know we have one more question in, in here. Um, how is case conferences completed in the app? And I don't know if this is too long of an answer or if you want to just um, refer them back to our website. But if you wanted to mention something in terms of how that takes place in the app, you'd take a minute or two to do that now. Well, for case conference, conferences or coordination of services, I'm not sure. Yes. The question is, how is case conferences completed using this app? Sorry, Arlene, that's for you, for the Access Care. I apologize. Well, that's okay. Um, well, the, um, the agency would need to invite the clinician to any kind of case conferencing at all. Um, as far as the application is concerned, um, the coordination of services is the same as any coordination of services. You would still have to document that. You would still have to talk the clinician would talk to the other disciplines and that type of thing. But um, case conferencing and coordination of services are two different things. So I'm not sure exactly what the question was about. The coordination of services, though, as long as the clinician was given the information about the other disciplines with in the on the case, they would be coordinating with that person or those other disciplines. Thanks, Arlene. And here's another follow-up question. I'm trying to take these as they come because I think people are really interested in trying to understand this yeah. a little bit better. They're saying, is liability of professional insurance included in access care? So when these um, clinicians or nurses are out in the field about professional, um, all of the liability around what they're doing out in the field on the behalf of the, the agency that's um, sending them out there. Each one of these clinicians that are using the application are independent contractors. So they would be responsible for having their insurance and their liability insurance uh, covered um, under their independent contracting agreement. And there isn't with the agency. Yeah, and I know that that's really important in, in terms of background checks and liability, making sure that you know the most important thing, I believe, we all want to make sure that that patient is fully um, taken care of, but also, you know, by the appropriate person, right person, right place, right time, um, and someone that's delivering safe quality care. That's correct. Yeah. Here's hey, Jeff, I just wanted to, to address that a minute, that, that right person, right time. Um, Access Care app was the first to come out with the electronic badge during the COVID pandemic and the essential workers badge. Um, and I think that's very important to note that um, essential workers um, during the pandemic, if you guys remember back, it seems like forever ago, um, on the road, people couldn't be driving in place because of the pandemic. We were supposed to be you know, socially isolated. Well, Access Care has a badge that's electronic. It uh, distinguishes them as a uh, worker, uh, essential care worker. So if they were pulled over by law enforcement or by others, you know, they easily show that badge. That's also a safety net for patients too, going into the home. Um, they're able to display that badge quickly and easily um, to show that they are that right person at the right time. Thank you, Tammy. And there's another question that came in and kind of tags on to the whole technology piece and how we're trying to move technology to the next level. And the question is, what role do you see or what role you see in enabling speech recognition in improving productivity, job satisfaction, and improved documentation? So the whole AI and speech and video incorporated yes. into this app, I don't know which one of you or both may want to jump in on this one. Very exciting. Well, I'll just say real quickly, I do know that, that Access is working on that. And um, Tammy may have more information than I do on that, but I do know we had a meeting just within the last couple of weeks and that came up and we do have plans for implementing that. It is yeah. available right now through access, but I, I do know that that's, that's in the planning stages. Yeah, but Tammy. I would say our, our normal talk to text, Arlene, is, is, is pretty good. They understand Southern really well. Um, they can, they, I, I play with the app and I do the talk and text piece and it, it picks up my accent and actually gets the words right. So to me, we're pretty progressed in just the, you know, the regular talk to text portions of it. But I see it being a huge component to efficiencies um, and productivities um, in 2022. Uh, wouldn't it be great 
if you could just dictate after you left your patient's bedside and your notes complete and your whole oasis is completed. Um, we have a, a 15 minute oasis available through access certification that kind of talks to you about how you can do that efficiently. And now that you've given me that idea, I think we're going to tie that whole speech into it. So um, thank you, whoever asked that question. I think that would be an awesome thing to tie into our 15 minutes. Thank you, Tammy and Arlene. And yes, I was in that same meeting. We were having some brainstorming conversations at Access about, you know, documentation and how that could be all dictated. And then also mm -hmm. in terms of compliance, you know, if there's some way to videotape the um, patient interaction so that if there are, you know, there, there are questions or you get audited, there's an opportunity to have some type of visual that could show type of care that was provided. So this is coming. Technology definitely is driving change and innovation and, and um, efficiencies. So just, just stay with us and we'll be announcing new things as kind of the next year or two roll out. But this is something that is very exciting and I appreciate these questions. So talking about questions, why don't we move on to the second poll question? Valerie will pull it up for us. And again, it's just like the last one. We'd like you to select one or or more um, answers to any of these. And the question is, to meet increasing referrals, how is your organization supplementing full-time staff right now and in the next six months? So we're wondering if you're connecting with contractors or hiring full-time staff. Are you partnering with a staffing agency? Are you paying staff overtime? Are you training upskilling and upskilling new or current staff? or are you turning away referrals? And we are he hearing that large agencies are turning away a tremendous number of referrals. And that's the one thing we don't um, want you to have to do. We wanna be able to give you a solution so you're not doing that. So let's kind of give you uh, 45 seconds or so to respond to the question and we'll have Tammy and Arlene reflect on the results. Arlene, why don't you take this one in terms of looking at some of the responses here and any trends that you might want to see? Um, this is, yeah, this is pretty interesting. They're pretty, they're really close to about the same percentages. There aren't any that are just way outstanding like the documentation and quality in the past one. Um, but connecting with contractors, hiring full-time staff, yeah, that's that's true that uh, a lot of agencies are doing that. And at contract that's what i was talking about earlier was that using the access care app and that technology um that is really saves people an awful lot of money hiring full-time staff is incredibly important and i wish everybody the best of luck in doing that um we're going to have to be somewhat creative um in making sure that we have uh have the ability to do that i was talking to uh, see today and it's interesting they're having tomorrow they're having they're calling an employee summit. and in the summit um, they're energizing um, activating and educating um, is their theme for the summit and so they're bringing all of their staff in and they're having a party and they're going to educate but they're also going to motivate these people and they're trying to get people excited because I think that one of the problems we have right now retention isn't all that great and so we have to really be concerned about that. So what we have, we want to hang on to. Um, so again, um, there are contractors out there. Um, I see people using contractors primarily for therapy. However, they can use their contractors for aides and um, nurses as well in most states. So um, that is something folks are looking at doing. Um, so the next one, it looks like pain staff overtime. That, again, um, one of the things that we've tried to help with as far as the application is concerned is um, the pain overtime gets really, really costly. You've got payroll uh, taxes to pay. You have um, paying the staff themselves. And it burns people out. We talked about that a little bit earlier. These um, clinicians are getting burned out with working um, the hours that they're working. Um, turning away referrals, it, that's interesting that that's on the, but that's only 41%, but that's still high. Um, and that is incredibly unfortunate. And I'm hearing that doctor's offices are going to, 
having to take on more within their doctor's offices because they can't, just like the call I told you I had before we started this webinar, um, the doctor's offices are actually having to provide care in the doctor's offices. These people are having to find transportation to the physician's office. And so those types of things are unfortunate. That's not even talking about the revenue that's being lost within the organization. It's incredibly important that um, we try to do what we can to get these referrals taken care of. And I, I do think that uh, the combination of the certification program, the education that Access is providing in combination with having this application available for the clinicians and for the agencies that's using it um, is gonna be incredibly helpful um, so that you don't have to turn down those referrals. So um, th these are interesting statistics and it's, um, um, partnering uh, with the staffing agency is one of the lower ones, and I can understand that as well. That gets to be very, very expensive. So um, one of the things I did not mention was when uh, agencies are using this application, it's kind of an interesting um, tool to use. If you're looking for um, staff, uh, you can actually um, kind of try the staff member out to see how they work within your organization. There's no cost to hiring that person. Um, so there's no referral fees or anything like that. The, the clinician is free to move about um, within uh, the different um, agencies, the organizations as they please. So um, it's a really good way to, um, to check people out and find out if they would be a good match for your organization and possibly offer them a position. So um, paying overtime is gonna be very, very expensive for folks. All, all of these all of these options are. So what we wanna do is to be able to, to retain those people that we get and um, some of the um, items that Tammy and I have talked about today are one way or some ways in doing that. Thank you, Arlene. That's, that was really important for you to reflect on kind of all of these different strategies and Valerie, thank you for putting the results up. You can pull down that and um, bring us back on screen. So thank you, Arlene, for reviewing that. You know, there was um, a question in the chat. Tammy, it was towards you. There's a, um, I guess there's a friend of yours that said, um, I'm logging in from Guam and I love the access to your application and I wish we could use it here in Guam and would it ever be available? So I don't know, you know, Arlene, what, what is what's the tra trajectory on uh, access care going further than the 50 states? Well, I, I bet you Arlene and I could work on that and get that to Guam. Um, whoever that is in Guam, uh, half a day, and I'm glad you're joining us. Um, much our friends there, so great, great that you're on. Well, I just wanted to let you know you had a friend that was, that was <laughs> reaching out to you and thanking you for the information. Um, we have about five or six minutes left. I think um, one of the important things to talk about right now is the COVID vaccine mandate. Um, CMS should be coming out shortly. We heard today that they're going to be coming out with the rulemaking around healthcare organizations and the mandate for the vaccine. We did hear an earlier version by President uh, Biden and his thoughts around making sure that healthcare workers are vaccinated so that they are providing a safe environment as they go into people's homes and care for people. But uh, the official word will be coming out shortly. Um, Tammy, do you wanna talk a little bit about the vaccine mandate and how that might be impacting the workforce distribution challenge? Sure, thanks Deb. And, and I think we're already starting to see that as organizations have put in their own policies and procedures related to testing and vaccine mandates. Um, we're starting to see um, more of a scarcity of workforce. But again, I think that we can manage that with technology um, based on, on what your policy is and what your organization's policy is. Um, here at Access, you know, we have the ability to track testing we also have the ability to track vaccines and mandates. Um, I think that's very important. Um, and I think it's important that, that, that we realize that, you know, that organizations are not gonna be forced to do vaccines. Um, there is a choice of testing as well. Um, so, you know, folks can consider that when they're, they're considering their scarcity, 
scarcity of uh, workforce. And just know that, you know, use your technology to be a partner with that for that tracking. Um, I, I think that's the biggest takeaway for technology. And if you're going to have to track boosters every six months based on your policy, you know, that could get very time consuming. Um, and certainly at Access, we're thinking about all those things. Um, Access Care is thinking about all those things and putting those um, safeguards in place within technology to make it easier for HR, um, for risk managers, um, for, for compliance people to track and to trend uh, whatever that policy is related to vaccines. Thank you, Tammy. Um, we have time for one last question and I'm gonna ask Arlene this one because she actually started mentioning this earlier in the webinar, talking about value-based purchasing coming, right? Value-based care, which means that agencies going to be paid based upon the outcomes that they deliver um, based on what what they are contracted to do and Arlene what about this workforce challenge and workforce shortage how do you see this playing into value-based purchasing do you think it's going to create additional challenges or what are your thoughts around this and how can agencies be successful or as as successful as possible in doing well under the new value-based purchasing model. I do think we're gonna have a problem with the shortage and the, the scarcity of, and the, re, the, uh, the distribution issue with uh, clinicians. I, I do think we have to start thinking outside the box, like Tammy was saying earlier, if we do things the way we've always done them, we're not gonna be successful. Um, patient outcomes should have always been our goal um, to be reached in home health care and in, a hosp well, in hospice. However, um, it seems that it, that's been uh, an issue uh, with home health agencies for a number of years. And I think we need to start looking at technology to augment much of what we're doing. Uh, with PDGM, we, we have PDGM that just started not long ago and value-based purchasing almost coming um, as a perfect storm for us. And so the PDGM, when we went to PDGM, we started looking differently at how we distributed our visits. So we, we de decreased the number of therapy visits that were being done. Our lupus rates were redistributed. Um, we have different lupus rates for different types of diagnoses and different types of OASIS assessment, the scores on the OASIS and that type of thing. So that happened. So now we have outcomes coming up and we have to make sure that we have, have credible outcomes. You need to get the information to the patient. We can't be um, skimping on the number of visits are being done if the patient needs it. And PTGM did not say that that's what they, they intended us to do. However, what's happened, we've had to do that because in order to to actually stay in business. So I think we need to look at technology. I do think that telehealth is one of the things that is on the radar for a lot of the politicians. I think that during um, the uh, pandemic, we started looking at remote care monitoring and using telehealth to um, supplement a lot of what we're doing with the shortage of staff. That's an incredible piece of technology that we can use. Um, I do think that agencies start need to like quickly start looking into remote care technology, uh, finding a remote care um, technology vendor um, that they might rely on for uh, for that use. There's a lot of teaching that can be done on there. There's things that we can do with the technology that we used to do face to face with patients that we can now do through cameras, just like this, uh, through cameras to, through um, uh, remote remotely. So I, I do think it's going to impact, but I do think that if we uh, think outside the box, try to use some um, creative thinking and how we're going to accomplish these specific outcomes, um, we're going to be just fine. But um, again, it's kind of like a perfect storm, value-based purchasing right on the heels there. I mean, we're we're going into um, uh, an era that we aren't familiar with other than the nine states that have already been in there and there were winners and losers there. So we have to be ready for that. Um, we, have, we only have a few months now to get ready for what's gonna happen in January. 
Um, I know we're probably not going to financially feel the hit until 2024, but now we need to get ready for that and um, thinking outside the box to using technology. And I know that Access is looking into um, other areas of technology that will help with that. Um, but using um, the educational piece that Tammy talked about, coupled with uh, an application like Access Care um, and um, remote care technology, I think we'll, we could be fine. Thank you, Arlene. I appreciate it. And we're wrapping up now. I appreciate you, Tammy Ross, and I appreciate you, Arlene Maxim, for all of the information you provided today. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access, empowering care anytime, anywhere.